Shalom Harim. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon, and you're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Uh, we are a production of IsraelReturns.com, and uh, as usual, I'm sweating again. These lights come on, and it's just rough on me. I tried to drop down in some thinner clothes. Uh, I can't say that black is what makes you sweat more because I'm um, in the air-conditioned house. It's just these lights seem to do it, regardless. Anyway, when you sweat, you itch as well. So hopefully I can get my mind off of all that and get it right to the Word of God. I'm bringing this video to you because uh, I done uh, I had uh, did a news broadcast, and in the news broadcast I mentioned about uh, Ethan Barach, who was the Israeli boy that died 20 years old in the war in the Gaza uh, as the ground invasion began. And I believe it was a brother that made a comment that's, that was irritated, I guess, or upset, or whatever you might call it, basically stating that Steve believes that uh, you don't have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior to go to heaven. And, uh, and a lot of that rhetoric kind of gets started, and a lot of people that do not understand or do not really pay attention to the to the message that, that God has laid on my heart uh, for Israel and for the Gentile people as well, uh, it's easy to get things construed. Now, there's many people, many of you guys, you listen, you've listened now for a long time, so you know my stand on that. You know it's by the Word of God, but I, I have to keep in mind there are literally thousands that have come in since I've really uh, spoke on this subject, so I need to come back and address it again. Uh, I know I've always said I'd do a little disclaimer. Brother Dan laughed at me up in Chicago and he said, Brother Steve, you don't have to do a disclaimer. We love it when you shout. But this video may contain, contain shouting. Maybe not at first, so you can at least watch for the first maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, but it's a very passionate subject and it, it needs to be addressed. Um, so we're going to look at how the blood of Christ actually atones for the Jewish people, as well as for children. you got to keep in mind, when children die, where do children go? Now, there's some legalistic type thinking people that think, well, children, when they die, they go straight to hell too because they never accepted Jesus Christ their Savior. That's pretty nonsense if you ask me. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ is all about. It's for, for atoning, uh, especially when one does not have the ability to atone for themselves. Now, if we know that He is the Messiah, and we reject it. Now that's when it comes back on our own head. Even like, for example, in the, uh, the, the, the casualties of the conflict with Gaza, there's children. We're seeing the horrible pictures of children that have died as a result of this conflict. Do I believe that those children go to hell when they die just because they're Palestinian children? Absolutely not. I believe that the blood of Christ can even atone for these children as well. In fact, Palestinians, you have to understand, any Arab, any Muslim person, this is your opportunity, just like it is for European Gentiles or African Gentiles or American Gentiles or, or Central America, South America. This is the hour for the Gentile people to recognize that Yeshua is indeed was the Mashiach. It's your hour too. And yet, so many Muslims are so caught up in wanting to destroy Israel that you're missing your own hour. The only ones that, are, that have any remote possibility is going to be these children that, that die in these conflicts, except for those that do believe. And I thank God there are people that believe. And, and don't think that we're, we're dead set against Muslim people. You know, we actually are, are, have been in, in sponsorship of a Christian group in Pakistan. So we do, we love people everywhere. And regardless if they're Muslim, well, Arab, I should say, because even the Muslim, if he converts, he becomes our brother. He's no longer Muslim. He's a, he's, he's a believer then. But when it comes to Israel, there's a lot of things that people have no idea about scripturally, how God deals with Israel. It's totally different. It's not that it doesn't use the blood of Jesus Christ, because he does, and it's by his blood that keeps those Jewish people from having their lives lost. Let's take a look at the Word and let's see what it says so we can actually get this down just right. Kippa's bothering me too today. Okay, here we go. Let's start with Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. Maybe I should do this from the Christian King James Version because I go to reading in the Jewish Bible a lot of times and I know you guys are like, what in the world did Steve just quote? Well, what Bible is he reading? So let's, all right, we'll do it from this one. 
Uh, chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Uh, Yeshe in Hebrew is his name, Yeshe. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord, that's capital L-O-R-D, that is Hashem, shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, I'm probably thinking, Brother Steve, what in the world does that have to do with the Jews recognizing or knowing that Jesus or salvation? We're getting to that. John chapter 9. Now we're going to the Christian side here, to the Christian New Testament. John chapter 9. Um, and we're going to go to verse 41 in chapter 9. And it says right here, Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So you have to understand, the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years, and including during the time of Jesus, see, when, when Yeshua was here on the earth, there was a remnant that believed him that were Jewish. And they became saved. But then again, if you're blind, according to Jesus right here, if you say you were blind, excuse me, if you, you were blind, see, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. What about the Jews, though, after them? What about their children's children's children who would be blind? Now, Jesus clearly says, if you were blind, you should have no sin. Interesting, isn't it? So when a person is blind, not talking about physically blind, he's talking about spiritually blind, then there is no sin imputed to the person that has that. Let's look at another scripture here in Proverbs 24, uh, verse 12. Okay, so we go to Proverbs 24. Uh, let's start with verse 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? You see, when you don't know something, God, he knows your heart. He knows the heart of the Jewish people, that if they could know that Yeshua was the Messiah. They would believe him immediately. But there's something going on in the Jewish people that they're not able to see. Now, occasionally you have Jews that come out and believe. That's true. But not all of them do. So why is it that there's so many Jews that just cannot see? In fact, I had a man ask me that very question the other day. He was a man from Russia. I was over in... Uh, um, West Palm Beach, and we were discussing the Bible, and he asked me, he said, Steve, he says, why is it that the Jews just can't seem to believe? Well, this, you're going to see why now. This is the reason right here. This, they, 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 even even uh, the Bible says they've been given to slumbering eyes. You know, there's so many prophecies about this in particular. Now, let's go ahead and turn to Romans uh, 11, and probably once we leave out of here, this is when we're going to really start picking up on the pace. Everybody knows about Romans 11. Romans 11, it's a beautiful chapter. I'm going to take you, I did a message on this. You can actually look it up where I did one on Romans 11. I did the whole chapter on here. Okay, now we actually want to begin in chapter 10. And let's start with verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went out into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, 
No, no, notice this now. He's talking about their sound have gone out to the entire world, to the ends, ends of the world. He's quoting the scripture right from the Torah. Their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the world. Their sound. Do you not realize that he's talking about radio and things like that where the gospel is preached to the entire world? That's a prophecy right there. I mean, gosh, un unbelievably so a prophecy. I mean, you're talking about Deuteronomy 32, 21 and, and, uh, and Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 32, 21, where it says their sound went into all the earth. That's prophetic. But I say, did not Israel know? See, watch this. So he's asking the question. Now, Paul asked the question, but I said, you didn't, didn't Israel know? In other words, they should have known. But he says here, first Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and, and by a foolish nation, I will anger you. Okay. Now, I'm sorry, that one above when I was talking about the sound, that's actually from uh, the book of Psalms. Psalms 19.4 and also from 1 Kings 18.10. The one I just read you now, that's the one that's actually from Deuteronomy 32.21. That's where um, it says there, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made, made man, excuse me, sorry, back up, Steve. I will provoke you to a jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now, that's the Gentiles coming in. So God's going to provoke Israel to jealousy because he turns to the Gentiles. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That's from Isaiah 65 too. I say then, going into chapter 11, verse 1, hath God cast away his people? See? So now Paul's showing you what the Jews, how they would respond, how the prophecies were there, how the gospel goes to the ends of the world. And so then he asks the question, hath God cast away his people? That's the Jewish people. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Hmm. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What not ye uh, what, what not what the scripture saith of Elias, who maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, speaking about Elijah when he says Elias, that's Greek for Elijah against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So don't think that you're just... just that, that He's trying to get you to understand when he says that there, though, that, you know, like Elijah, the Christians, like Elijah, you're not alone. Though all the evils have come about and you see all the evils that Israel's doing and that's exactly what Elijah was going through. Israel was being so evil and cruel and wicked as a nation that he felt like he was the only one left. And so he says right here, um, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to, uh, to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So therefore, I do believe in a remnant of Israel being saved. I do not believe just because a person says that they're Jewish that God saves that soul because of that. Now, that's not what I do believe at all. But I also recognize that the blood of Jesus Christ atones for the Jewish people when they're trying their best to keep His word. And yet they die anyway. They, they're trying to keep the, what word they do know. And so therefore his blood is there to atone for them under those conditions. And you're going to see why. 
So please take the time, listen to all the video. Don't just turn it off and say, that's it, that's crazy. No, you need to hear all of what I'm going to tell you so you understand better. And if by grace, then, is it no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of the works, and it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which, it, which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, we just read the scripture just a moment ago. Even Jesus says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. And now he's talking to the Pharisees right then and there. Paul's talking here nearly 50 years later. And Jesus says, because you say you see your sin remaineth. But he said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Now Paul comes along, what, 30, 40 years later, something like that, when he's speaking to the Romans here. And he writes right here. Verse 7, what then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Well, Yeshua just said, if you're blind, there will be no sin. Hmm. He doesn't impute sin to a man that's blind. And also, as we read in the, the other one, in Proverbs uh, 24, 12, you know, does he not consider it? If you say, Lord, we didn't know it. But you have to remember, as Paul's going to bring out to you here, you're, we're, the, the, gen, the Jew was blinded for your sake. Okay. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and trap and a stumbling block and recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Mm. And then have they stumbled, excuse me, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. You understand, see, the whole purpose that Israel is doing the way they are and have turned against, they're, they're against Yeshua, they don't recognize who he is. How can you get a blind man to know who Jesus is unless his eyes can come open and he can see? And yet so many people are critical towards the Jewish people because they just don't know. He says here, he says, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now, let me just say this to you as we're going along here because I'm sure there's some people like, there's no way. There's no way that God is going to save them unless they accept Jesus Christ, their Savior. Well, Ezekiel in his prophecy, in chapter, I believe, was it 38 or 39, where it talks about the house of Israel, the dry bones, can these bones live again? They actually say, our hope is lost. This is the house of Israel. These are Jews that have died that never knew Yeshua. They never knew Jesus Christ to be their Savior. And they say, our hope is lost. Let's look at that real quick. We'll come, we'll come right back to Romans here, but let's take a serious look at that. It's, it's very important that we divide God's Word correctly, not according to our imagination, or you know, but according to His Word. This is where the Gog and Magog War comes up. And um, I believe it's in... Um, is it starting 38? Is that where it's at? Let's see. I can't recall right off here where this is at, but uh, uh, it's also when he brings the two sticks together, the stick of Ephraim and, uh, and Joseph, which is the house of Israel and the house of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Judah, they become one again as a nation, but first the house of Judah must return home first, according to Zechariah's prophecy, chapter 12. Uh, but the thing is, is when Ezekiel, when he's dealing with Ezekiel, the, the valley full of dry bones, uh, 
he actually, uh, I'm just trying to quickly find this here. Yeah, it's actually in uh, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which is full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, they were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live again? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How many of you guys know that the Gog and Magog war is a battle that's going to be fought in modern times? Ezekiel 37 then is speaking about the Jewish people all the way down through the ages up until modern times that have died. Okay? Prophesy unto the bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone when I beheld lo the sinews and the flesh see it goes on and on and on to, to speak about that so I prophesied in his breath okay and, and then said to me son of man I'm, I'm just trying to skip down see if I can find this real quick therefore uh, I think it's verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place in your own land. Then shall you know that I am the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Um, that's still not the one I want. Here it is. It's verse 11. It's right before that. Let me read this to you. I want you to catch this beautifully. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The whole house of Israel. Imagine that. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Their hope is lost. Now this isn't remnants of the house of Israel that became Christians later. I believe that there are parts of the house of Israel that do, did become Christians in modern days and stuff and down through time. But this are, these are Jews that maintained they were Jews all through the, the last nearly 3,000 years that they've been scattered and they're brought up from their graves and they said that their hope is lost. But God makes a commandment and swears that he's going to bring them out of the graves and bring them back to Israel. And so then how can you say then that they're not going to be saved, that God, that the blood of Christ doesn't atone for the Jewish people? Did he not say in his word, if, they, if we don't know it, does he not consider the hearts of the, the, the thoughts of the heart? See, he, he knows what Jews that really died believing his word the best they knew how and they went down. And so therefore God says, thus saith the Lord, I'll raise them up again. Why do you think the gospel is preached through the millennium? What need is the gospel to be preached in the millennium if there's not going to be a reason for it to be preached? I believe that the gospel will be preached in the millennium because you're going to have children that never knew about him. You'll have Jewish people that come up that never knew about him. Hmm. Okay. So we see this in Ezekiel's prophecy here that Israel's raised up. Now let's go back to Romans again. Let's take a look at this. Romans chapter 11. We, we left off around verse 12. For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Uh, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? 
just like he sees, just like you see in Ezekiel's prophecy. And he goes on to say, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root of the fatness of the olive tree, boast not thy, uh, against the, uh, the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Yeshua, Christ is the root of the olive tree. How can you boast against them? How can you speak against the Jews when you're speaking against him? Boast not against the branches. See, don't speak against the Jews. That's what he's saying. They're the natural branches. Don't speak against them. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root. In other words, if you're speaking against them, you're not even grafted into the tree. Imagine that. We claim to be Christians, but the, and there's ones out there that say they're Christians, and they speak against the Jewish people, and God tells you right here through his uh, apostle Paul, if you speak against them, if you boast, in other words, if you say you're greater because you're in the tree now and you were thrown out, he says, don't do it. The root's what's bearing you, the same root that bore them. Don't speak against them. Verse 19, Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. Thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. See, it comes back around. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity uh, of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. See, it shows us that it's coming back. God's going to return to the Jews. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to the nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. By the way, think about it now. When he's talking about this, he's not talking about a branch that's been cut off so long that it just dried up, withered, and went away. The branch is not dead. You can't take a dead branch and graft it back into a tree. It's got some form of life, doesn't it? That branch has to have some form of life long enough in order to be regrafted in again. And you know, the odd thing is, I actually had a friend of mine years ago. I was really, really young. I don't know, I was probably 18, 19 years old, something like that. And he used to do that. He used to take fruit branches and graft them into trees. Very interesting process. And I, it's hard to believe that the branch would actually graft into that. I was I lived over, uh, actually I went to school and... Um, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and that's where that's where I was at at the time. And a friend of mine, he lived there in Fort Walton Beach, and I was over at his house, and he showed me that. He said, "I can look at watch this." And he had like a little plastic bag wrapped around the limb with some kind of like little I don't know peat moss or something like that in there. And I asked him, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm grafting the limb back into the tree here." I thought that was interesting. Kind of like God heals a cut in your body. You know, you get cut. Doctor can't heal that cut, but it'll surely. God's word because of what his word says that he's the one that heal up all of our diseases that that wound will heal back even for those that don't believe it'll heal back imagine what he can do if you do believe interesting for I would not brethren that, that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles be come in so Israel is blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now Jesus said the same thing. He said that until the Gentiles be fulfilled is the way he put it. That the desolation would happen to Israel until the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now what really is the desolation? It's not so much just of the temple being desolate. He's talking about their heart being desolate. They don't, they're not able to receive the Holy Ghost because they don't recognize the one that is the, the, the one that gives the Holy Ghost, which is Yeshua. 
But once they recognize him, then they'll be able to receive it. So, okay, so anyway. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion uh, the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now that's according to Daniel chapter 9. He's going to remove those sins. No wonder why he raises up the house of Israel to say that they have no hope and gives them an opportunity for salvation. You have to understand, what did, what did the Jews do? Let me take you to Matthew 27, 25. I'll never forget when God revealed this to me. I was blown away by it. Brother Gary Lowry that you've seen with us on here before. Um, I think this is the one scripture that really got him when I first told him about this. He has told so many people about this scripture. Matthew 27, 25. Um, Pilate saith, and I'm going to back up to 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with this Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And then the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, and he took water and washed his hands, before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And they released Barabbas. Now, no doubt, the children of Israel at that time meant what they said for an evil purpose. But it's without question God applied his blood. When they said, let his blood be upon us and our children. Do you know Moses would take in the commandment of the Lord when he would take the little turtle dove and, and one would be sacrificed and he would take and sprinkle the blood. There's another commandment there where God would tell him sprinkle the blood upon the people and he would sprinkle the blood upon the people. Do you know why? It was prophetically speaking about this passage right here. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Just like it was in the story of Joseph when his brethren sold him out, throw him in the ditch, and they're, they're thinking seriously about killing him. If it hadn't have been for, for Reuben, they would have killed him. And Reuben, as he's trying to figure out a way to get his brother free, to send him back to his father safely. And by the way, his name means behold a son. Can you imagine them arguing all the, all the time? You know, Reuben, we don't agree with you. They kept saying, behold a son, behold a son. Hello, the son was right there being, get, getting ready to be killed. But they sell him out anyway, 20 pieces of silver, like Jesus sold for 30. You guys know these things already, you know. But what, isn't it interesting, though? There's one thing, though, that scholars have never pointed out to you, though. After they sell him, and he's headed down to Egypt to be sold down there, they take his coat, and they, pour, they take and sacrifice a goat, and pour it on that coat. And then they take it back to his father and say, discern whether or not this be your son or not. And of course, his father, Jacob, is just totally distraught over what appeared to be the death of his son. And see, that's a beautiful type of Yeshua in itself. It, it appeared that he had died. When Yeshua was on the cross and he gave up the ghost, it appeared that he had died to the world. It appeared that he had died. But in reality, he was never dead because only the body, only the shell, and that, that, that coat represented the shell. It represented the body of, of, of Joseph. And his father, he began to weep and mourn over the shell, over the coat, and yet... Had God not accepted the blood of that goat that was poured out on that coat, he would have required the life of his brethren that did it to him. And it's interesting. 
You know, in the sacrificial laws of Israel, when you, when you sinned and you would bring your little lamb up, you would have to lay your hands on the head of that lamb. And while the lamb's throat was cut and was blading and everything and his life left him, you were feeling that that lamb was taking your place when you should be the one paying the price for your own sins. But he takes your place. Do you not know that Joseph, like that lamb, when they had their hands on him and throwing him into that ditch, their hands were upon the sacrifice official good in this case the scapegoat he became the scapegoat their hands are upon him and their sins were put upon Joseph just like laying their hands on that sacrificial goat every shadow and type in the story of Joseph speaks of Jesus that's why they said let his blood be upon us and our children and Jesus himself on the cross, Yeshua said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, if he forgave them, can't we as believers realize that, that Israel is forgiven? If he wrote in his word that he would not hold them, this would not be held to their charge. If you read where Paul says that they would be blind until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, then surely the blood of Christ can atone for the Jews. They can't see it yet. Then why do we boast against them then? Why would we look at them and say they can't be saved? They never received Jesus Christ as their Savior. He knows that. I can prove it by the house of Israel. The very scripture that everybody wants to quote, Ezekiel chapter 37, that he said, they, they even say, our hope is lost. We have no hope. God says, thus saith the Lord, and he raises them up. Put sinew on them. He brings them back. And no, they never knew that Yeshua was Messiah. But he, gives, he brings them back, and not only does he bring them back, he brings them back to Israel again. Now, I know there's some that try to say it's metaphoric, and it's, it was shown that the Jews are coming back. The really, they can be metaphoric in that regards, because the house of Israel, for the most part, has never gone home to Israel as of yet. It's the house of Judah which is also biblically correct, because God says he would raise up the house of Judah first. You know, let's pause for just a second. Let me, let me bring that one to you. Zechariah 12, um, verse 7, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitation of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. He saves them first. Why does he save the house of Judah first? Because it was the house of Judah that was the one that took and crucified Yeshua. They have to come back. They have to atone for the evils that were done. Now, I say evils. We got to keep the scripture perfectly in line. Israel had to do what they did. Had they not offered up Yeshua to the Romans to be crucified, there would be no salvation at all. So don't be angry with them. What did Joseph say to his own brethren when, they, when he first began to reveal himself to them? He said, don't be angry with yourselves. God did this to save life. And I say to you as the Gentile believers, don't be angry with the Jews. Don't be angry at them because Yeshua's life was delivered by the Jewish people. They had to do it. It was prophesied when Moses, when God told Moses, take the elders of Israel with you and go out to the rock two weeks into the journey. Not the one 38 years later where God tells him to speak to the rock that it bring forth his water. But about two weeks into the journey, they're thirsting to death. The people are complaining and they're saying that God is not among them any longer. Same argument was 2,000 years ago when Yeshua walked. Is this God or not? And God tells Moses, take the elders of Israel, go out, smite the rock. It would bring forth its waters. 
He was showing that Israel, that the one, do you not know that the, that the Pharisee Jews today, they have this custom that they believe that whoever that high priest is now, he sits in Moses' seat? The high priest Caiaphas at that time, sitting in Moses' seat, Jesus speaks about that. It's not right, but he speaks about it. See, he sat in Moses' seat. No wonder why they have, a, they have a custom not knowing it's to fulfill biblical prophecy. And what did he do? Caiaphas takes and he goes and he gets the elders together. They come and they judge Jesus and they smite him. And don't say, they did, oh, don't say oh no, the Romans smote him. No, they smote him right on the face. They pulled his beard out. He was spit upon. Everything that you see in, in, in 1 Samuel with David, when David is leaving Israel, you know, because his son doesn't recognize him to be the Messiah, I mean, excuse me, to be the king of Israel, the anointed king of Israel, and he's a rejected king. He goes and he weeps over Israel on the Mount of Olives. Jesus did the same thing. He stood on the Mount of Olives. He looked over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left to you desolate until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of, the, of Hashem, in the name of the Lord. What house? He's not talking about the temple. He was talking about the human heart. He came to give them the Holy Ghost. He was the rock that was going to be smitten. He was the rock that Moses smote in the wilderness that brought forth the waters, the waters of eternal life. That's why he says to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was talking to, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you water. You don't come here no more. And then the Israel, they smote him. When he was put on the cross by the Romans, and that Roman centurion took that spear and stabbed him in his side to see if he was dead or not, and water come from his side showed that he was that rock. And he'd been smitten. And the Spirit of God, that water that come from his side, separated from the blood, showing, oh man, that's so much to the Jews. If you'd only open your eyes, my Jewish brethren, so much is there to you. The water shows that he was the rock itself that came forth, but the water and the blood come out together, separated. It shows that even in the temple when the sacrifices were offered and they used the water that came through like a little stream, washing the blood from the sacrifices out of the side of the temple, he was stabbed in his side. And out of the side of the temple came the water and the blood from the sacrifices, showing that he was the Lamb of God. How could we reject him? We could, the only reason we could is because it was to save life. God had one girl in mind down in Egypt, and her name was Asenath. That was Joseph's wife. And when she married Joseph, she became Israel. She became a grafted in branch. And even the Pharaoh of that land loved Joseph. He loved Jacob as well. Do you not see what I'm talking about, though? It was done to save life. Israel, had Israel not offered him up, had they not fulfilled the biblical prophecies, this is what it means to be a chosen people. It's not because the Jews are better than the Gentiles. It was because we were called for one purpose. We, oh my gosh, do you not get it? Lord, help me, dear God. When Abraham was willing to offer up his own son to God, he pulled the knife up and he pulled his hand back to go to kill his own son. And, and the angel grabbed his hand and a voice spoke and said, Stay your hand, Abraham. God was looking for someone that would offer up his son for him. Someone that would believe him enough that would do it. Not just anybody would do that. 
That had to have been the strangest thing to happen on life, to see a man to go to offer up a son that he loves with all of his heart. But what was God doing? He was testing Abraham to see, would his descendants have the same heart that he had? Would they be willing to offer him up? And the thing is, is God knew that Israel would love Jesus so much that they wouldn't be able to do it unless he blinded them so that they could not see that he was Mashiach. It's the only way they could have done it. He had to withhold their eyes. He had to blind them. Now, of course, there was a remnant there that would believe no matter what. Because there's always a remnant down through every age. There's always a remnant of Jews that believe. But had Israel not done what they did, they, then there would be no salvation for the Gentile or Jew. That was what was enabled the Holy Spirit to be poured out because you have to understand, inside of Yeshua was all the Holy Ghost. He was the tree of life. Did he not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? He was, he's claiming to be the life. If he is the life, then he was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. He says, I am that way. In other words, he's the way to get back. That's why he breathed on his apostles after the resurrection. He said, receive you the Holy Ghost. The same way God did in the Garden of Eden when he breathed in the nostrils of Adam. Nishmar Chaim. And he breathed in Adam's nostrils God's own life. Not in a singular form. He didn't say Nishmar Chai. He said Nishmar Chaim. Because his bride was in there. Do you know why Eve was inside of Adam? This is something that might throw your mind up for a loop. People think sometimes, well, you know, the Eve was in there, she's less because she's just a byproduct of the man. That's nonsense. She was inside of Adam because God was showing where you were. Man and woman that are the bride of Christ. You were in Christ. Your spirit, your life, because of sin, in the fall, in the Garden of Eden, God was unable to complete the mission of giving the Holy Spirit unto His children as they were born. So that part of eternal life that God had intended for you to have that personal relationship with Him, God had to block that way now because He had to make sure that there was a sacrifice offered for sin on your behalf so that when He put that life in you, you would go right and not wrong. That you wouldn't do the way Satan did, use the gift of God for perversion. Satan being an angel of God and got lifted up in his mind. God knew there had to be a sacrifice and that sacrifice was Yeshua and inside of Him was the life, the eternal life, the Holy Spirit for every child of His that was going to be born on this earth. This is why Eve was inside of Adam. God was showing us where we were beforehand. We were in his heart. And so when God opened up Adam and he brought forth Isha, she wasn't even called Eve. She was called Isha, the fire of Hashem. She come from Min Ish, from the fire of God that was inside of that man called Adam. And God just separated the feminine from the masculine. There was not one greater than the other. The fall is, is what caused God to prophesy and say, the man shall rule over you, not by divine decree, but because of fallen man, he would try to boss his wife. Sad, very sad. So many scriptures are so misunderstood. So therefore, men, I, I really encourage you, don't try to boss your wife. Love her. Pray for her. And wives, you pray for your husband. If he doesn't have that revelation as of yet that God called, that God called the two of you to be partners, filled with the Holy Ghost in, in Christ, then pray for him. You have to understand, many doctrines have been taught wrong for years. 
But well, that's a different message altogether. We can go into that much deeper. I'll take you through the writings of Paul and show you the mistranslations and everything so you understand. There's so much that's misconstrued there, it's not even funny. But anyhow, that was the whole purpose of Christ. There's also a scripture that's written in the, in the, in the Tanakh that says that if you sow the wind, you reap a whirlwind. That was another prophecy where God was prophesying how that Israel would try to bury the spirit. The word wind in Hebrew is spirit, ruach. And that the sowing means to plant or to bury. And that's what we did as Jews. We tried to bury Christ. And because of what our forefathers did, we reaped a whirlwind, which is uh, it's actually like a, a storm. See, God has a law of judgment, and that's what Israel was under. He set that law in there in order to be able to even atone for the Jewish people, to atone for our own sins. And see, he even speaks about in his word how that, you know, that we would, we would have to atone for our, you know, in our affliction. See, that's, that's in Hosea. Let me just share with that. There's many other scriptures besides Hosea that speak of this as well. But let me just share with you Hosea real quickly. And we'll be closing here soon. And I know I've just, I've just kind of highlighted this. I've not gone to it deeply as I should have. I tried to start this message so many times and just was unable to really get going with it. Um, but there's a lot more I wanted to share with you. Hosea chapter 5 and also chapter 6. But in chapter... Um, Oh, uh, gosh, maybe not Hosea. Um, no, yeah, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Verse 15 in chapter 5, I will go and return to my place. This is God speaking straight to the children of Israel. To they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. See, what was their offense? Although that God knew that we had to offer Yeshua as a sacrifice of sin, He still knew that it, it was, our, it was the, our offense. It was the thing that we did that was wrong. Like David in Bathsheba, he was a man after God's own heart, but he sinned against God when he took Bathsheba. He said, In their affliction... They will seek me early. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn us. He will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. See there? God is promised to bring the Jews back to the knowledge of Yeshua. The thing is, though, I can't encourage you enough as Christian people that time is drawing to an end for the Gentiles. This is a time to try to win every Gentile you can to Christ. What happens when he gets up off the mercy seat and he comes to the Jewish people to reveal himself? Remember what Joseph did when he raised up? He dismissed all the Gentiles from his house. Now the Gentiles were actually eating at the same table. They were separated though. It's interesting, they were separated because the Gentiles and the Jews couldn't eat together. According to that then, it said the Egyptians considered eating with the Jews was an abomination. Isn't that funny? The Gentiles, it was an abomination to eat with the Jews. What a shame. But the thing is, is God loves Israel. He knows he blinded their eyes, just like Joseph said. God did this to save life. This is what the Jews did. This is what our forefathers did. And so therefore, He's atoning for us because He's held our eyes blind until our eyes can be opened. Now, if you've got a Jew that's just living in sin, could care less, doesn't care about God or anything else, because I don't say that God saves every Jew just because they're Jews. But if that Jewish man is trying to serve God with all of his heart, with all that he knows, and he dies... And he's blinded like the other Jewish people are. Then God's mercy will atone for him. He says that he considers the heart. He knows it because the question they ask, they go before God and they said, we didn't know it. He says, does not the Lord consider it? 
Let me read to you one other scripture too. I may have to just do it by memory. It's in Revelation. It's under the fifth seal when they, they cry out, How long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood on those that are upon the earth? See? It's Jewish people. Gentiles don't cry out for vengeance. But they ask that question to God. How long until you avenge our blood on the face of the earth to those that have killed us? Well, we know that can't be... That can't be... Uh, yeah, I've got that scripture right here. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And see, it doesn't say they have the testimony of Christ. But they do what? For the word of God. They hold the word of God, you know, that can be the Torah. Their testimony, they're Jewish. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Only the Jewish people have the vengeance cry. If you're a Christian and you're crying for vengeance, well, maybe you're Jewish then, because Jews don't do that. I mean, Christians don't do that. Yeshua was that example. He said, Father, forgive them for what they're doing. Stephen, the first, who was... It wasn't even an apostle. Stephen, I believe, was a deacon, if I'm not mistaken. And he cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Everywhere you see, they don't know what they're doing. They're blinded to it. The same thing was with, uh, uh, um, who was that? Shimei, with David, cursing David, spitting on him and everything. When David returned back, though, he was there to apologize. But did you ever see him die in between then? No. Another type of salvation to Israel. Um, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That would be those Jews coming down through the ages. God knew that many more would die. So I'm really persuaded that the Word of God supports that the Jews that have, as the Bible says here, they have the Word of God and the testimony that they hold, that there is mercy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood is upon them. And upon their children. It's um, the same thing, I believe it's in Ezekiel 36. Um, and I think it's really important, maybe we should just read this too. It's right before Ezekiel 37, where he brings out the valley of dry bones, but he says here, verse 19, And I scattered them among the heathen, that they were dispersed throughout the countries, according to their way, and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. How did they profane God's holy name? And that, now watch this. Watch carefully. God's name is profaned. When what? When they said, that's the Gentiles, when, or the heathen, heathen word is the same for Gentiles. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. So God's name became profaned or unsanctified because Israel's not in her homeland. That's the only reason. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, wherever, whether they went, wherever they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do this for uh, not for your, not for, Excuse me, not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen wherever you went. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you and a new heart also I will give you and a new spirit.
will I put in you? Nonetheless, it's amazing what God does. My friends, I, we thank you for listening and taking the time. I trust this has been a blessing for you. Um, hopefully by tomorrow I'll be able to post for you the different places that we will be going to. Uh, I believe we're going to do North Carolina as well with the brother up there. They have a little private meeting that they're working on in uh, western North Carolina. It's a little country town there. Um, if you live in western North Carolina, southwest North Carolina, let me know. Uh, because we'd like to be able to meet you there at the meeting that's going to go on there. Uh, but right now, on the 8th of August, we will be in Houston, Texas. So email us at contact at israelreturns.com. Let us know you're gonna, that you'll be there or you're going to try to make it so we can give you more information as well as we'll post it on Facebook and on our YouTube, on our, um, gosh, website. We'll pay, post it on the website soon. We're going to actually put a calendar up before too long. On the, in between the 8th and the 14th, I believe it is, hopefully we'll be in North Carolina there uh, for just one evening there. Then we have to move on to Indianapolis. And I believe the meeting, the conference there is on the 15th and 16th. I know it's a Friday and a Saturday. I know that. Friday, Saturday. Uh, we'll be speaking on Friday and Saturday at the conference there with Sister Susan um, and Sister Donna at that meeting there. Um, and then I have to get back to South Florida right after that. I'm meeting Lori Cardoza more uh, here in Fort Myers around the 18th or 20th. So I forget which date is on that also, but we'll be keeping you up to date on that. Um, we certainly love you. We need your support as well. If you feel blessed by this ministry, there's a lot that we're trying to accomplish. We never set prices or anything where we go or anything like that. Uh, it's actually your support that helps us to go and take the Word of God to different places. Uh, even when we went to Chicago, it was your love and kindness that made that possible. Because there's some people that they don't have that ability to do that. So therefore, we just thank God for people like yourselves that are part of this ministry that make that possible. Uh, we're looking to go back to Israel, hopefully by God's grace. Uh, the first part of September. It depends on how war things are going because they will close down the airports if things get really out of hand. Uh, but I am going to try my best to get back home during the holidays. I don't know how well that's going to be this year based on the situation, the climate that's going on in Israel right now. So pray for us about that, that God will make a way for us to go home. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, that's, I think that's about all I can think of as of right now. But uh, And also pray for us because we need to move out of South Florida. Uh, we've got to downsize. I am stopping the, the delivery business that we've been doing. One, it's not doing very well because I can't give it my full attention. Uh, I want to give my full attention here, speaking with you guys, keeping you up to date. And the only way I can do that is to step out on faith and trust God that he will place it on the people's hearts, what the needs are. So my wife said, we need to move out of this house here. Uh, we want to get out of Florida anyway. Uh, we need to downsize because also being over in Israel and here at the same time, we need to find something very reasonable, uh, some type of, we can find a little piece of property up in some mountain area, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, wherever it might be, uh, or some kind of little small cabin, maybe, you know, 1,600, 2,000 feet, something like that. My wife's always wanted to be in a log cabin, so I know that's her desire there, and I'd love to see that fulfilled as well. And that would be a lot simpler and all that kind of good stuff. But anyway, we love you guys. God bless you. And uh, uh, if you need to write to us, write to us at contact at IsraelReturns.com because we are having a lot of trouble with AOL. It seems like now the government filters all of our email. Unbelievable, but they're filtering our emails now. And so we see very little email anymore. So we're having to use another alternative means. I guess I don't like what we're saying. God bless you, Baruch Hashem.